about navigating without a navigator. We're going to be talking about using critical landmarks for revision surgery. And um, I think that this can be really helpful, not just in revision surgery, but also in some of the more complex surgeries that you guys run into. So why do you need these landmarks? Well, what happens when you have a CT scan like this? Or you have a patient with polyps, maybe not a revision surgery, but they're completely filling the nasal cavity, and now you need to carve out this area to find the sinuses. So this is why these type of revision landmarks are important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of a systematic process of how you're gonna approach these patients. And the first thing is to identify anatomic sites that are contributing to recurrence. So this really allows your kind of targeted plan for revision surgery. And in fact, you wanna really get a detailed clinical endoscopic exam, something that you've heard from everybody when they're talking about doing surgery. But this tells you about the sites of the disease. It talks to you about the state of the mucosa, because you're not going to see that on imaging. And it's going to help you document things like scarring and landmark distortion so that when you go into surgery, you're not surprised and you're able to create a plan to address those things before you end up in the operating room. You also want a thin cut CT scan and you must have all three different views, the coronal, the sagittal, and the axial cuts, because especially in revision surgery, that's the way that you're going to be able to open and approach all of those areas and create a good plan, and even a plan A, and possibly a plan B. And then you wanna review that CT scan systematically. So I'm gonna briefly go through this checklist. This is a modified version of the checklist that actually Dr. Davis uh, had us do when we were residents, and I've expanded on that a little bit, and this is what I have my fellows and my residents do, and they all email me this before we go to surgery. So you wanna look at the presence of each sinus and attention to asymmetries in those sinuses. You wanna look at the septal position and perforations that you might have the frontal sinus and the recess anatomy, so do you have additional cells, but also um, supraorbital ethmoid cells because that's going to impact not only where your frontal is gonna be and how big your frontal is versus the supraorbital ethmoid cells, but also the anterior ethmoid artery location. And you wanna know if that anterior ethmoid artery is within bone. You wanna locate the inferior turbinate in relation to the orbital floor. As one of the previous speakers talked about, sometimes that's gonna be a very small distance, sometimes that'll be a very big distance, but that's gonna change how you plan your surgery. The presence of the middle turbinate, which may or may not be present depending on what surgery has been done before. The location of the uncement attachment superiorly. Any haller infraorbital cells, because you wanna address those while you're there. The skull base slope, anterior to posterior, every once in a while on a sagittal, you're gonna see something a little unexpected, a little blip, and you wanna know about that ahead of time, and your Keros classification. And then you're gonna be looking for dehiscences of bone in all of the different areas. And also, you wanna look at your sphenoid, the intersinus septum, does it go directly to the carotid? and any anode cells that might be present. So this is the checklist that I use when I go through. This is the checklist I expect all of my trainees to use. So I just want to highlight a couple anatomic sites contributing to recurrence. Some of these have been talked about before. Uh, one of them is retained ethmoid septations. And frequently in revision surgery, this is a challenge because they can become neoosteogenic or thickened bone, as you can see here in this left ethmoid. Also, haller cells which is here in that right maxillary. You can also see some retained septations and that neoosteogenesis because it's becoming thick. So that way you're gonna have a plan that this may be something that you can't just remove with a simple through cut. You may need to be able to remove this with something like a kerosene. The anode cells that overlie the sphenoid because sometimes you'll see one opened but not the other. So you wanna be paying attention to this. Also the pneumatization in those areas with the carotid, the clinoid can be different if you have anode cells present. And then the frontal cells. Here I'm showing a type one, but there are different pneumatizations for the frontal and the different frontal cells. You wanna be aware of those and plan ahead because you wanna make sure that you're gonna address each of them. When you only open into that little type one cell and you haven't opened the full sinus, you really haven't done that patient justice. So at this point, you want to be thinking about your landmarks. And most natural landmarks often are missing or distorted in revision surgery. Many people use extradural navigation. There are definitely cases in which I'm using extradural navigation. But this is not a substitute for a clear understanding of the imaging. And really, you should be prepared to operate without navigation. And this is important because sometimes your navigation won't work. Sometimes you can't get it set up to the accuracy you want. 
Sometimes um, it'll be off in the middle of the case, and if you are so reliant on it, you need to stop your case. So you really want to have a plan where you can do this without just having the navigation. That doesn't mean that I don't have the CT scans up in the room every time I'm operating. They're always there. In fact, I carry my laptop into the OR in case the computer in the OR doesn't work, just to make sure that I always have access to those scans. And you want to focus on landmarks that are consistently present, and so we'll talk through what those are. So that way you can deal with a CT scan like this one. So these are the revision sinus landmarks, and I'm going to go through all of these in detail. But the nasal floor, the coanal arch, the septum, the nasal lacrimal convexity, the medial orbital floor, the posterior maxillary wall, the lamina papratia, the fovea ethmoidalis, and the planum sphenoidale. So we'll revisit all of this list. I'm going to talk about a stepwise approach to surgery, kind of as you would go through the surgery. I want to focus on the consistent use of these landmarks and safe entry into nasal cavities. So first thing you want to do is set your initial boundaries. So that's this top set, the nasal floor, the coenal arch, and the septum. Setting that anterior posterior nasal boundary is really important because it gives you the depth of field and helps you then determine where everything is. So here, the first thing you want to look at is the nasal floor. We all probably do this anyway. This is just making you a little more conscious of that process. So you want to identify that nasal floor and follow it posterior to the coanal arch. And so I've shown it to you in that terrible CT scan uh, patient that I showed you, but also in this schematic. And then the next step is your coanal arch. Most people still have their coanal arch. So you'll be able to find that. And that's going to set that anterior posterior extent. And those are your dimensions. Then the next step is defining the medial nasal boundary. In these patients, it's going to be the septum or the remnant of the septum. Some people will only have a little ridge. Some people have their total septum intact. Some people have perforations. But you want to be looking for your septum. So I've marked that here on each of these schematics and images. Once you have that, now you really want to be looking at where are your sinuses and defining those boundaries. And that really starts with the maxillary. The maxillary sinus. Um, uh, landmarks are really your nasal lacrimal convexity, the medial orbital floor, and the posterior maxillary wall. So when you open up your anterior maxillary, your first thing you're looking at is this nasal lacrimal convexity. And that tells you, this is that arch of the posterior lacrimal bone edge, and it tells you what overlies the lacrimal duct. So most patients will still have this bone unless they've had really significant lacrimal duct surgery or they've had a large tumor. And this defines that anterior cavity boundary. So this is one of the first things that you can look for, and this is present in most of the patients. Inferiorly, you're also going to be looking for any remnant of the inferior turbinate. And often in these patients, the nasal ostium isn't visible, but you should look to see if it's present. If it's scarred off, we're going to talk about how you can enter that maxillary safely anyway. So as you approach that maxillary entrostomy, the safest entry point is actually the posterior fontanelle. This is a sagittal schematic. And what it shows is that at the posterior one third of the inferior turbinate, that's the area with the greatest distance from the orbital floor. So you have the most room to enter with the least risk of hitting the orbit. So this is a place where you can put in an angled probe, enter and push inferiorly and posteriorly and get into your maxillary sinus with the least concern about injuring the orbit. And I'll show this to you in a video in a minute. And then a wide entrostomy will define your maxillary cavity. The maxillary cavity is what we use to then help us navigate to the other sinuses. So you want to define your, your medial orbital floor, or MOF. And so I've highlighted that here. You also want to define then your transitional ridge. So that's that cut posterior fontanelle. That's what's shown here in yellow. And that ridge sets that anterior posterior trajectory, because that's the trajectory it's going in. And it also defines where your posterior ethmoid cells are, because you're going to be able to enter in the coronal plane right near this. So you're going to draw a line, which I've shown here, this red line with the green in the center. And that line goes from the transitional ridge over to the septum. And in the center of that line, that's where your posterior ethmoid cells are going to be. That's the inferior most posterior ethmoid cells, so in this area. And the last thing that you want to define here is your posterior maxillary wall. And the reason is your coronal plane of the posterior maxillary wall sets the level that you should be expecting to enter the sphenoid at. So it's giving you the depth. So I'm going to give you an example. 
This is an allergic fungal sinusitis case. We do a lot of that. This is the CT scan. You can see the brighter areas here are the allergic mucin that contain all the minerals. And so first we have a patient with a lot of polyps and it's filling most of the nasal cavity. And the first thing we wanna do is set that anterior posterior boundary. So we're removing some of these nasal polyps. We can take them out with forceps. We can remove them with a microdebreeder and we're keeping in view the septum, the inferior turbinate and trying to make sure that we set that anterior posterior boundary. So here we're starting to define the coena in the back. You can see that opening. And now we've set that distance. So then the next step is going to be bringing in our curved probe and starting to enter into the maxillary. So we're bringing this in. We're in the posterior one third of the inferior turbinate. I've marked out where the middle turbinate is. And this is that posterior fontanelle that you want to enter in. We're pushing down and back so that we can really open into this area. And as you saw in the scan, this is going to be filled with thick allergic mucin. This is all that kind of peanut butter consistency stuff. And once we take some of that out, we're going to be able to see then the cavity of the maxillary. So you want to remove it, see the cavity of the maxillary before you start using any powered instrumentation. This is taking a backbiter and then coming forward so that we can take out the uncinate completely. And you can see that this is thickened bone, it's got polypoid tissue on it, and it's become neoosteogenic from chronic inflammation, which is very common in these allergic fungal sinusitis patients. So this is the way that you can get into your maxillary sinus, even if you don't have a natural osteum, even if you're not able to see all of the normal landmarks really well, and you have a bunch of polyps. So then we want to move on to opening up the ethmoids. So we want to use the medial orbital floor, which we've already defined, the lamina papratia, and the fovea ethmoidalis. So your ethmoidectomy, you define, again, that medial orbital floor. You're going to use that to enter the posterior ethmoid cells, which I've shown you. So this is that area. And then in your anterior ethmoid, you're using that um, medial to horizontal transitional ridge segment to define that area. So now we look at a sagittal view. Here again is your medial orbital floor in this sagittal viewpoint. And in this viewpoint, you want to be thinking about defining your lamina papratia because that's setting your lateral border. That's what you don't want to go beyond, right? We all want to stay out of the eye. So that's going to be as far over as you can go. It's going to take out all of the septations. And so that's located laterally in the posterior ethmoid. And once you define that landmark, you can use it to work retrograde coming forward. During your ethmoidectomy, always important to think about how you can Beautiful. be the safest as you're moving along because you have the thin skull base above you. So the fovea ethmoidalis is the area with the thickest bone. And if you remain laterally, you're going to stay parallel to the lamina. That means you're taking out all of the septations and you're along this thicker bone. So here's your cribiform plate, which is much thinner. And here is your fovea ethmoidalis with this much thicker bone. And in this location, you can see that this way you're going to stay much safer. Then you want to move on to opening up the sphenoid. So planum sphenoid alley is one of the landmarks you're going to use once you've opened it. But to get there, the medial orbital floor and the posterior maxillary wall are important, as well as the coanal arch. So for your sphenoidotomy, the medial orbital floor, again, since we keep talking about it, you're drawing that line across going to the septum. And here highlighted in green is where you would enter into your septum. And you're using that posterior maxillary wall to set the depth. Because again, in the coronal plane, the entrance to the sphenoid should be at the same depth as that posterior maxillary wall. So if you're entering way in front of your maxillary, you're probably not entering into a sphenoid. You're probably entering into an ethmoid cell. Your coanal arch is also a great landmark because your osteum is about 1.5 centimeters superior to that. And again, seven centimeters from the anterior of the nose. And once you're in your sphenoid, you can reassure yourself that you're there because you're going to see the planum sphenoid alley. So I've highlighted here that um, cella convexity in green and the planum sphenoid alley in purple. And that also sets your skull base. This is the lowest portion of your skull base. And for most patients in the sagittal view on the CT scan, you see that this is the lowest place. And it's always going to come up as you come forward. So this is an example of opening the posterior ethmoid and sphenoid, again, in that same patient. 
So same CT scan. And so here you're seeing the coanal arch, you're seeing the septum, that trajectory from the transitional ridge, the sphenoid, the posterior ethmoid, the medial orbital floor. We're taking a kerosene and removing some of the bone over the posterior ethmoid so we can start opening up that area. You can see all of the thick mucin that keeps filling all of the different uh, locations. And in these patients with polyps, we don't get quite as concerned about being worried about stripping mucosa because most of the mucosa is so diseased that we need to take it out. So here we're opening up all of the ethmoid cells and then we're taking a caudal, putting it right across from that transitional ridge into the sphenoid right next to the septum and opening up that sphenoid ostium. And you're gonna see in a second, as we take out that soft tissue, you'll see the entrance to the sphenoid and how that really is more inferior and posterior to your ethmoid cells. So this is the schematic of how you can see that when you're operating. And then obviously we're gonna open up that area a little bit more. We're gonna take out all of that bone so that we get a really nice view. And then you end up with something that looks like this. You have an open maxillary, your sphenoid, and your posterior ethmoids. And then you can start working your way forward. So the last thing we wanna talk about is your frontal sinusotomy. This is where, again, you're using the nasal lacrimal convexity that defines the trajectory to the frontal sinus. So it's shown here in orange. And a line posterior and parallel to this is gonna give you that nasal lacrimal duct. So this is kind of in the coronal plane of the uncinid and the infundibulum. And that helps you define where your frontal sinus is. And also you can see this in that sagittal view. If you have your middle turbine, or at least part of your middle turbine attachment, the anterior middle turbine attachment is five to 10 millimeters anterior to your frontal infundibulum. So if you see that, you can work your way a half centimeter or a centimeter back and expect that it's going to also be in that area. That gives you yet another way to start kind of triangulating where you should be finding that entrance. So this is uh, one additional example. This is a, a guy that we did earlier this month. Here's the CT scan. We have a lot of patients who end up with frontal sinus disease and orbital collections, which is what you're seeing here, and in a patient who has actually only one frontal, and that frontal got blocked, and you can see how narrow that patient's opening to the frontal is. Their outflow tract is very small. Otherwise, this patient has had really nice surgery. So there's not a lot of other surgery to do, but we do need to address the frontal to be able to stop having these orbital collections. So this is a very quick video just showing this patient. So this is the initial endoscopy in the operating room, and you can see the inferior turbinate, the sphenoid, the maxillary, some of the thick mucus that's there. All the ethmoid septations have really been removed in this patient. And here you're really seeing that we don't have a lot of obvious landmarks for that frontal. I'm gonna pause this just for a second because I think I, I made the video a little bit short. So here's your nasal lacrimal convexity. You can see the septum. And what is not coming out, I think, well, at least on some of these screens, is that oval is the olfactory cleft. The middle turbinate has essentially been removed from this patient, so you're really just looking up at the skull base. So almost entirely, the nasal lacrimal convexity and the septum are what you have to go on to find this. Now, this is a patient that we did have navigation in, but when you have someone who has so much swelling in their face and that's changing on a daily basis, a navigation scan is not going to be that accurate. And so that was exactly what we found. We really could only use the navigation scan really as a scan that we could look at in the operating room, not really to tell us exactly where we needed to go. So this is taking a frontal sinus probe. And notice the trajectory we're using here, trying to remove some of that really thickened scar tissue. Then we're taking frontal sinus curettes. This patient has some bone over their orbit, but it's very weak bone. So we wanna be very cognizant and palpating. We're going through all of this scar tissue and making sure that we're working in this trajectory. So once we get into the, the um, very narrow opening and entry into that frontal sinus, you'll soon see that we end up with quite a bit of nice pus coming out. So we're able to clear this area out and then we need to make it larger. We can't just leave it with that pinpoint opening because we're gonna end up with the exact same problem in this patient. 
This is a patient who also happens to have, um, is on dupixent, has some um, immune deficiencies, and has a variety of other problems. So this is a patient who ended up getting what I would call a modified allotherapy. They got a draft 2B plus. And this way, we're able to really open up all of these areas. You can see that I've done a septectomy so that I can get from one side to the other side to really open up and get the angle on doing the drilling here. The hole that you're seeing there is actually the lateral extent of the frontal sinus and the narrowing between the more medial portion and the lateral portion of the frontal, which we opened up with additional drilling. So in this way, we're able to get a much larger opening for this patient. But I think that the biggest principle here is that the entry was the hardest part. Once we're able to get in there, then we know that we're in the frontal sinus. We're able to do the advanced part of the procedure. So I'll show you a little bit about what the resolution looks like. This, is, um, this patient does have absorbable packing, but we did do a scan afterwards. And you can see a much larger opening in the frontal sinus. And ultimately, we went from about 2.5 to 3 millimeter opening in the frontal outflow to at the narrowest point, a 9 by 8 millimeter, and much larger for the rest of it. So this patient I expect to do very well, and their fluid collection has resolved in the eye, so we're hoping that they long term don't have this problem again. So in review, um, these are your landmarks, and I think we've gone through them in pretty good detail. We review the detailed CT scan. We know where the disease is located. We know what landmarks are going to be available. Maybe not all of these landmarks, but most of them. And we want to have a clear plan. So this is just a last little video about putting it all together. This is a patient who had uh, chemotherapy and a terrible sinus infection, had previously had sinus surgery, and you can see was still infected. So this is the entry into the posterior fontanelle, the middle turbinate, the septum, and you can see that we're entering and trying to get all of this pus out. This patient failed IV antibiotics. She really didn't want to have to stop her six months of chemotherapy, but we did it anyway because of such a vast infection that we couldn't clear. And in this patient, we did pretty big openings into the sinuses just to make sure that we weren't going to have to go back. So this is the maxillary that we're opening and clearing out a lot of this pus. This is primarily Pseudomonas, although she is growing AFB. We did this last week. And as we open all of this up, then we can clear out the disease, start defining that maxillary cavity like we were talking about. So you can see where your turbinate is. You can see that we're starting to define the medial orbital floor. We're really opening widely this maxillary, so that helps dictate where we're going to go. And I have done this at a faster speed for a time. If I could operate this fast, I'd be very impressed. So again, this is your trajectory. Now we've opened it up. We have the medial orbital floor, the transitional ridge. We've drawn the line over. You see where your sphenoid and your ethmoid should be. And we're going to demonstrate with the caudal where that line is, the coanal arch. So this is our entry into our sphenoid, of course, filled with purulence and nastiness. We're going to use our kerosens to take down some of that bone. We want to make sure that we get a nice wide opening, and all of the bone here is neoosteogenic. You guys didn't see the scan, but it is pretty significant. And then we're using kerosens to open up the posterior ethmoid and slowly take out all of these different septations. One reason I like using kerosens is because you can palpate laterally, feel where the um, lamina is so that you know that you're against what you, your lateral border is, whereas with a microdebrider, you can't really feel it that well. So again, here's kind of the landmarks. Now that we've opened the sphenoid, some of the posterior ethmoid, you see the remnant of the middle turbinate. And we're going to work our way forward. So we've defined our lateral boundary. And we're using the kerosens now to come retrograde. And now we're going to start opening up our anterior ethmoids. We'll often use a curette to see if we can get some of this bone off. But because it's so thick, in this case, I ended up mostly using kerosens to do it. And in every single cell and in every single location, we have pus coming out. So it's just you know, something you kind of have to get each little bit of disease, as one of the previous speakers talked about. If you leave it in there, it's going to be a nidus for disease. So this will give us a good view of now where your anterior ethmoid is, your posterior ethmoid, your sphenoid, and your maxillary, and that relationship. And we're defining our lamina, removing all that neoosteogenic bone over the lamina. And the last thing we need to do is really clean up our anterior ethmoids in the front and find our frontal.
So we see the relationship at the maxillary, and here we're using a 70 degree scope. We're looking up towards our frontal outflow. We're gonna use a probe, and remember the same trajectory that I was using before, using the nasal lacrimal convexity and the trajectory to allow us to find that frontal sinus. So here it is kind of written out for you. And then we're just gonna carefully open that area. And luckily this patient's frontal was not that bad. We just needed to remove all the swelling in the outflow track. I think it was the only place that you didn't have pus. So one thing I will um, comment on that a lot of the other speakers have commented on, we use angled scopes um, almost always. I operate with a 30 and a 70. No matter what you learn to do, and here you can see kind of our final result, um, it's important that at the end you're able to at least look with some angled scopes and make sure that you've really opened everything that you think you've opened so that you have really gotten it all completed. And getting comfortable with that in the lab is I think something that will be great for all of you. So I just want to acknowledge two of the fellows that you watched operating, Aaron Riley and Mila Brandalia. And I also want to acknowledge my partner who um, is the reason that I have all of these different schematics. He also was my fellowship director and they're all reprinted with his permission. And thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>